You're listening to the Men in Blazers Media Network, Suboptimal Radio. The funny part about it was I did not hear the whistle blown for Alex to take the penalty. And I'm like standing probably five, six yards behind Alex. And she starts like approaching the ball. And I almost like screamed like, stop, what are you doing? Because I just didn't hear the ref blow the whistle. <laughs> like I thought she was just so in the zone, like going for it. And she started going and I was kind of like looking around like, was there a whistle or is she just going to bang this penalty in and then have to do it again? It's Rog here with another episode of the women's game presented by Paramount Plus and joining me today back from the battlefields of CONCACAF, a conquering hero from your US women's national team and the Washington spirit, one of the finest number sixes in the game in the unbiased opinion of this podcast, known in some corners as DMV Zidane. It's a joy to welcome back Andy Sullivan. Thanks for having me, Raj. It's a joy to be with you, Andy. You've been with the national team for the past month. It honestly feels so much longer that you were down in Monterey, Mexico, at the old CONCACAF W Championship where the US beat Canada 1-0 in the final last Monday to snap up both World Cup qualification, a spot in the 2024 Olympics, and then ninth trophy in that tournament. Not a bad haul for a month's work. Right off the bat, how are you feeling physically, mentally? Feeling great. Obviously, when you have a big tournament and you win, that's always mentally a boost. (laughs) Physically feeling great. Uh, Before we left, I was having some like muscular stuff going on so I was a little nervous leading into that trip but the spirit managed me brilliantly and so did the national team and got to play a ton of minutes and I'm feeling great so ready to come back and bring that energy to the NWSL. Yeah I'm fascinated by your sense of energy I'm getting like just adrenaline by merely speaking to you but when you played a weeks long tournament like you've just done Is it a relief to come home and get right back into your normal rhythms? Or are you like, oh God, I wish I had like maybe a month to sleep this off. Yeah, the tournament is exhausting and just being away from home that long is hard. You know, if you're ever away from home, it's just a, you want to get back home. Reminder everyone, footballers are human (laughs) beings. Huge. (laughs) Forget. Yeah. And like you're used to going, you're used to being on the road and traveling, um, And normally during CONCACAF tournaments, I feel like we relocate at some point. And so it was like a blessing and a curse that we were in the same place because we had a great setup. The hotel and the staff there were so kind to us. And um, we really got to like settle in and make it kind of our home and our hub for the tournament, which is a positive. But then also you get kind of stir crazy. So that's, you know, the con side of it. Homesickness is a thing, though. One of the greatest uh, footballers of this Everton generation, Leighton Baines, was rumoured to have been left out of an England World Cup squad because he told the management he thought he might be a little bit homesick during the tournament. I mean, it it is a thing. I think also in other tournaments, I know, for example, during the World Cup, like friends and family come, but this tournament was... Some people did have family come, um... I personally did not. Um, And that can just be a nice kind of reminder of home uh, and a break and, you know, zoom out from your bubble world of the national team. Uh, And I think about I live, you know, in my home. I have an actual home in my market and my husband is there. And I think about all my, you know, NWSL and national teammates who that's not the case for. And I'm like, it's just, it's just a huge reminder of how, how lucky I am. But yeah, it's, it's a long trip and those tastes of home are always a a good boost, you know, but thank goodness for things like FaceTime and things like that to kind of give you that perspective and bring you back to earth. We are going to dive into the tournament in one second, but I've got to ask you the awful name of that tournament, CONCACAF W Championship. Does that mean they're going to rename the Gold Cup for the gents, the CONCACAF M Championship? I hope so. I think that would just be a good direction. If I mean, I know there's been discussions across the league about getting rid of the, the W and NWSL, which I'm you know more than open to. But it's like if you're going to call it the CONCACAF W, then 
call it the CONCACAF M. And I've started getting in the practice of saying, oh, like the men's World Cup is coming up. One of, one of our first live shows we ever did uh, in 2014 in Portland, right after the World Cup, we did it with Alex Morgan of a couple of thousand. It was an amazing in Pioneer Square. Uh, we just come back from the World Cup and she came on stage and I told her that we call the Men's World Cup the Men's World Cup, but the Women's World Cup we just call the World Cup because it's the proper one. And she's just in front of everyone. She's just goes, you're crapping me. But I do, I do. I crap you not, Alex Morgan. I think it's a bloody good idea. Well, let's talk about the W Championship. A lot of media punditry surrounding US performance throughout the tournament. Much of it really netting out as measured praise. People talking about the youth of the team, the opportunity to keep building more chemistry, uh, the need to keep building more in the final third. And US women's coach Vlatko Andonovsky admitted that himself, saying at one point he thought that the squad would be World Cup ready by next year, but that it wasn't yet. And I'm curious, inside the locker room, while the tournament is progressing, you win every game. You beat an incredibly strong Canadian team in the final. Do you still walk off that pitch thinking about the ways you could have been better? Or is it more at the final whistle with the trophy in your hands? Are you more like we were as good as we needed to be? Let's just savor those wins. Definitely both. Vlako had that comment to the media and he also said it directly to us. And I think that's important. And I think we all agree with that. And I think we'll look, you know, after every game, we kind of review the game and talk about the next game. And we haven't yet done that for the final. You know, we, we soaked up the win. It was obviously a lot of pressure to qualify for the world cup and then qualify for the olympics it's a huge relief to have done both those things um not to mention play and and beat canada who you know we obviously have a history with so i think we did a really great job of soaking that up and enjoying it and um for a lot of players it's kind of the first big tournament or first win over canada and being part of that so i think the veterans did a good job of you know educating us on uh how we play Canada and what it means. And obviously we've seen it, but being a part of it is different. So I think we really did a good job of celebrating that moment in the game, on the field, in the locker room, before we all flew out um, and really being together. And then, but very quickly it turns to, okay, when's game review? And when am I going to watch that film? And how are we going to, you know, beat them better next time like that's literally the mindset of the team is always like okay we got the dot we got the job done we got the result what's the next thing that was one of my questions how long exactly after the final whistle of that 1-0 victory against Canada did the Vlatko brain trust wait before they started the send out video breaking down the game they actually they haven't sent us the the video breakdown yet or we haven't had our 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 meeting yet but um have you checked your spam (laughs) <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> oh, and uh, it could be sitting there waiting for me. But when we came back, the NWSL had a break. And so I think both our NWSL teams and the national team were recognizing the difficulty of the season and the plus the difficulty of that tournament. Um, and so I was able to have a few days of rest um, and then started back up again this week. If I'm hearing you Correctly, what you're saying is the big victory of the tournament from a young American squad perspective was really that you now have tournament muscle memory to draw on. Absolutely. I think that's a big part of being in these tournaments is how to manage it. And I think that's also a strength we have on our on our team is we have veteran experience and we have depth and we have options and we have... Um, tactical adjustments and we're we're using all those and testing those and making sure we we are prepared for those situations and obviously that's why I think what Vlaco said is is relevant because there's so many other tests to come our way that we need to train so that when the world cup comes around a year from now we've tested everything or t- with ourselves or against an opponent Let's talk about the final. The US won 1-0, a 77th minute Alex Morgan penalty scored against Canadian goalkeeper Kaylin Sheridan, who had some incredible saves in that game to keep the scoreline really as tight as it was. And Sheridan happens to be a teammate with Alex at the San Diego Wave. Remember, listeners, back in June, 
She became just the third NWSL keeper in history to log an assist in a game. That assist going to none other than Alex Morgan herself. And it certainly didn't seem like this from Alex's flawless execution, but it must have added an extra level of difficulty for a penalty taker to face off against someone from training who knows you so bloody well. Alex has been so hot with penalties, gone both ways. So the only thing would be her maybe discussing with Sheridan what her strategy is. But we're also on the national team aware of like, okay, we have international teammates on our team. So we know not to share too much. Um, but obviously there's a lot you can observe from people's penalties. But I had full confidence as soon as we got the penalty. I'm like, oh, it's going in. The funny part about it was... I did not hear the whistle blown for Alex to take the penalty. And I'm like standing probably five, six yards behind Alex. And she starts like approaching the ball. And I almost like screamed like, stop, what are you doing? Because I just didn't hear the ref blow the whistle. <laughs> like I thought she was just so in the zone, like going for it. And she started going and I was kind of like looking around like, was there a whistle? Or is she just going to bang this penalty in and then have to <laughs> do it again? I was just baffled. But the whistle was blown and the goal did count. God, I love that notion that you almost iced your own kicker. Yeah, can you imagine? I would be cut from the national team immediately. Did you look around and were you like, why is no one else saying anything in this yeah. moment? Something awful is going to happen and only I can save the day. <laughs> Thank God I did not. Oh my gosh, yeah. My future would have been over. Uh, uh, a nation thanks you, Andy Sullivan. <laughs> and those celebrations that followed in the aftermath of victory, we saw a little bit... On Instagram, Alex Morgan gulping margaritas out of the trophy. Now, the CONCACAF W is not the World Cup. There's no complimentary beer goggles handed out in the locker room. And a lot of you are getting on planes home the very next morning. How hard does everyone go in the wake of victory? How hard does everyone go in the locker room? Well, they had it taped up for us. So that's one indication. Um, very hard on the spraying of the champagne but um and also like i said it's going into a break so i think everyone goes at their own pace and their own level and we all respect that but um it was a great energy i think again is more about like the camaraderie of being together and um in the giant margarita cup trophy making sure everyone feels uh welcome and praise for their work including people who are like behind the scenes a lot the staff getting their moment of glory what Andy Sullivan is saying, dear listeners, is drink responsibly. And sort of a weird question, but can you articulate what winning a big tournament feels like? There's there's a joy to watching the team you love win as a fan. But ultimately, that must pale in intensity to the feeling that you have having actually won that trophy yourself. There, And there's a reason you guys keep coming back year after year into final after final, trophy after trophy. Can you walk us through that emotional journey at the final whistle? Is it for this US team in that tournament as much about relief as it is joy? I think so, because I think that we know that, yes, this trophy is great. And especially because this one had implications for the team with the Olympics. Um, but I think we know the ultimate trophy is not in our hands. And um, so it's this mix of joy and relief and accomplishing the mission but at the same time there we have we have more missions coming that this is only you know this not that it pales in comparison but it's just a step to lead us to that so i think it's this it's this mix um and it was funny because when we made it to the semifinal it's like you know that you're gonna be there for a certain number of days um, and Vlaco did a good job of saying like, you know, we know we're going to be here till this day. And so we might as well win the whole thing. And obviously we wanted to win the whole thing anyway, but, um, just being able to tune in that focus to the goal at hand over and over and over again. So then once it's finally checked off, it's like, whew. I mean, this tournament is a step in a journey and you know, it's a time of uncertainty. Uh, in that journey as well a transition of the squad between cycles um, there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding so many bloody positions and I am interested even in collective triumph does that individual uncertainty surrounding some players not knowing whether they you know have strengthened their case to be part of the squad or not strengthened it is that also like a lingering note 
the national team, there's always that uncertainty, though. Um, but I think I'll just speak to myself personally because I can't really speak to others' uh, experiences throughout the tournament. But for me, I had been a part of Olympic qualifying in 2020, um, which was a great experience to be a part of. But my role minutes wise this tournament was much more i could get more minutes and then lower my stock that's still possible but for me in this in this tournament (laughs) um it was a huge step in my own individual journey that i felt like i was getting minutes and minutes in a final um or in a knockout stage against you know top teams and i was like oh i'm trusted on this team um by the staff and by the team and that's you know, I may have been trusted in the past, but I didn't have that feeling or that opportunity. So for me, I'm putting that in the back of my mind as like, oh, that's an experience that will help me prepare in the future. Do you guys share your fears with each other or is it all about keeping a strong public face in front of the group? The incredible thing about this team is that everyone has had those feelings and those experiences. There is not a single player on the team who has shown up and played great every day and played great every minute and gotten to you know do whatever role they wanted for as much as they wanted like that has never existed on the history of this team um so even players who you look at and you think like oh they're so full of confidence or they um you know they they're so secure and they feel you know that that's not true and i think when you share a feeling people are like i know exactly what that feels like and i think that's also it, like I've I've said this to people before, it's so difficult to describe the environment. And so if you ne- try to explain that feeling to someone outside of the environment, they're like, well, why don't you just do this? And you're like, it doesn't work that way. So the team is actually really good, especially, you know, when you grab someone and, you know, share how you're feeling. They're like, oh, I'm feeling the same way. Or like, I felt this way before and I did this. Or um, there's definitely a lot of that across the team and i think the the veterans particularly on this team are also a little more proactive about that um they ask people you know how they're doing how they're feeling what do they think um and try to like they're trying to impart a lot of wisdom on us which we're i'm like so grateful for because obviously they've been through way more than me and carry the legacy that they themselves were a part of, but also that others have passed down to them. So they've been they've been brilliant, honestly. It's impossible to describe this culture to someone who is not of this culture. Essentially, Andy, you've just described Fight Club, but I'm curious. So Can I can't talk about after? it. Yeah, <laughs> you just almost made a big mistake, but somehow, <laughs> somehow, you actually didn't. But I am curious. Coming home after a big win in that culture, in that place, that unique place, that unique pressure, that unique sense of shared glory. Is there a sense of letdown, the dissipation of all that protracted adrenaline, the the come down from that emotional high? And when you come back from a great vacation and you see your luggage back in your home hallway, do you feel a tiny bit blue? I think because the tournament was the result that we wanted, that it's easier to not feel as blue. I do think that It's always tricky, like, transitioning back into league play for me. Um, It is and it isn't. I think it's kind of a refresh, like, okay, I have to get back into this routine so that I can prepare in a different way. Um, Just preparing at home versus from a hotel and things like that. I think because the energy during the tournament was so good, um, even though it was long and tough, I... I came home and I, I don't feel as blue as I, I have in the in the past from other things. Because I can totally see what you're saying. That happened for me after the NWSL final. Um, we won with the spirit. And then I had to fly to Australia with the national team. And as soon as the plane touched down in Australia, I felt like the championship didn't happen. And I was kind of like upset and emotional about it because I didn't get to really like soak it up and celebrate for as long as it was warranted to. <laughs> Um, and be with my teammates like I didn't get to do that and I think um, then going into camp was really hard because also you people are like congrats but they're also bitter (laughs) um, as I would be too so yeah I I know the post post tournament blues you're referring to and I've experienced them before but I did not so much this trip so I don't know what that is I'll have to self-examine a little more figure out why 
We'll see how you feel after 35 minutes talking to me, Andy Sullivan. <laughs> the, the, the biggest come down of all time. But last national team question, because I do want to pivot to the Euros and to the latest in, N- in NSL uh, this weekend, uh, where things are in both the tournament and in the league, heating up literally and figuratively. Knowing that you now have the World Cup and the 2024 Olympics locked in, does that make them feel more real? Do you allow yourself to start thinking about them, particularly the World Cup, which is now less than a year away in more concrete terms or, or, or because there's so much football for you to play and because you're always focused on the next game, does it stay in the realm of a mere daydream for a while longer when you focus on the immediate challenges to come? Yeah, I think it does stay in the, in the daydream zone for several reasons. Um, I do think it is helpful for the for the team the national team to like know that we've qualified and i felt that like for the team um because also i was thinking like this sounds terrible but i'll 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 confess this i'll be honest like before the tournament like i said it's the first tournament where i think i'm gonna get major minutes and i'm thinking like i don't want to be a part of the team that that screws it up and by screws it up i mean doesn't win the trophy like that is the standard that we set whereas if we don't win it is a failure um and that's just because we're the best team in the world and that's how we approach things, um, which is incredibly to be a part of. And then you're, you're questioning yourself, like, can I hang? And I know I can, and that's the thing too, but that doubt can creep in and exist. Um, and you have to learn how to deny it and rewrite your story kind of in your mind. How do you do that, Andy? Cause I've got to say, when you say- I work with my sports psychologist a lot. <laughs> when you said that line earlier about that a player whose mentality is, I'm going to get a lot more minutes. Oh my God, so much more time for me to make a complete cock up of yeah. this. I was like, that that was my approach. That's my approach to life. But you work with your sports psychologist. What trick have you realized is the, is the stronger mind? I have been working with him a lot and I do like a daily meditation practice. It's been life changing, not just on the field, but off. And I think the the three things that we talk about are stay present, control what you can control and no judgment. So now when something happens in my mind, it's gotten pretty good where I don't even, sometimes I don't even need to call him or talk to him. I'm like, I know which one of these three, like I'm violating. (laughs) I think what I've learned a lot is like a lot about the judgment piece because it's okay to have that thought of doubt. That doesn't mean I'm mentally weak. Like it's just that I need to not judge it and not give it any strength and shift my focus again back to the present, back to what I can control. It's okay to feel down or like nervous, but I I don't know, life goes on, the world spins on. You know, Casey Keller once told me, when I asked him about the World Cup, I was like, uh, he said, I said, do you get nervous? And he said, yeah, my approach to it is if you do not feel nervous before a game, any game, he said, then you're kind of dead inside. So embrace those nerves. So for me, this tournament, the day before the first game, I kind of just started feeling this general nervousness. I was in good spirits. Like I wasn't harboring, focusing on something negative, but it was more just kind of this like, oh, like I'm getting big minutes. Like this could be, this is important, you know? Um, And I always like text, I usually text Drew or call Drew and I'm just like, hey, I'm like starting to feel nervous. And he's always says, Drew's my husband, by the way, I don't know if everyone knows that, but um, who's also a professional player. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. And he always just says like, being nervous is a good thing. Like, it means you care. And like, I think, again, that goes back to accepting the doubt or like accepting the feelings um and just like it's this is how i feel it's okay to feel that way and then again moving on rather than me trying to like fight my nerves and deny them it's just like no that's just what's happening right now and that means i care and that means this is you know important moment and i'm and then i think it goes back to like your preparation like i'm prepared for this and i'm confident in myself and i know my abilities and my team has my back knowing the difference between negative doubt and 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 natural nerves i guess that That is the secret to glory. And talking of glory, as we podcast, England national team are storming their way into the final of the Euros. Not the W Euros, just the Euros, um, where they will play either Germany 
or France. Really a tournament that has been a clash of heavyweights, some unbelievable football, some just some of the finest goalkeeping I've seen across the board in a tournament. I'm fascinated. This was going on as you were down there in Monterey, uh, the early rounds. How what, what what was the appetite for watching the Euros? How was it watched? How did how did the squad engage with it? It was actually incredible. So in Mexico, the games were on TV constantly. So easy for us to access. We trained in the afternoon uh, in Mexico just to be in the heat and near, you know, kind of closer to game time. And so the games were on, I think, 11 and 2 or something like that um, in Mexico. So we would watch them after breakfast, you know, before lunch. Then we watched them at lunch before training. And it was awesome. It was great. And like, we would all, you know, people would grab a coffee and watch it together or watch it in the meal room and talk about it. And, you know, who do you think is going to a couple people have a bracket? And I believe you should ask Becky about her bracket and who is in it <laughs> and what are the uh, what are what's on the line? You should ask her about that. Um, I, I will most certainly do that. Knowing Becky, she'll have America to go all the way. <laughs> but go on. <laughs> um, and I think it was exciting because I think. You're watching it both as a fan of the game and of these teams. And then you're also watching like, oh, we're going to play some of these people. And um, especially as we were advancing further and further in the tournament and qualified, it's like you have that different perspective in the back of your mind. So it was really exciting. And I think, again, to see the fan excitement around it um, is really uh, uplifting and a boost. What do you make of it all? Like what's really stood out? Obviously, the atmosphere, uh, the growth of the game um, in in England and, and, and the traveling fans from across Europe following with their teams. It's just been a just a life boost. But from a footballing perspective, what's your big takeaway? The growth of the game is that these games are close. They're competitive. There, there are so many players that are having like great tournaments or great games. Yeah, I think that it's just been really entertaining to watch. Yeah, and like motivating as a player, like to prepare to play against these teams. When you watch England in particular, delirious England, you know, how much do you understand this performance as just the boost of hosting, playing on home soil? Or are you having watched them uh, just win their way to game after game in this tournament, putting a massive fluorescent marker underlying in yellow by England as a team to worry about next year at the World Cup? I think obviously England's always always been a team to worry about, and they've also just been trending upwards consistently. Um, and I think they're really fired up about hosting, and you can see that in their play um, and in their celebrations and everything like that. And so, um, yeah, the further this tournament goes, I'm sure that's only increasing as well. So we'll, we'll see how they, they fare in, in somewhere down under. No one better poised than you to answer this question. Uh -oh. If tomorrow we drop you guys into the Euros, how do you like think you, the US team would do? That's a great question, but I, I mean, I, I never hesitate that we would, we would find a way because that's what the team is about. So, like, you tell me any team anywhere, the team's gonna find a way. I think a great example of that is like the first friendly after COVID. The U.S. played the Netherlands, I think, in the Netherlands or somewhere in Europe. And the Netherlands is a good team. And our a lot of our players had not been playing in the league or not been p training with the team. Everything was individual. And you go into that and you're like, how am I going to play two 90-minute games or a 90-minute game? And the team won. And I, I mean, I wasn't a part of that team, but I just think no matter the situation – we're going to find a way and it's going to have to do with a lot of like the dirty work and the mentality. And so, yeah, when I'm watching the Euros, I'm like, oh, yeah, they've got some quality, but I never that never makes me feel intimidated. I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Like, let's go up against some some of that quality or this quality and like, let's let's shut it down. I love that answer. I love that motto. I love that approach to life. Let's find a way to the NWSL. And after a long week's hiatus, NWSL is back this weekend, starting with your own Washington Spirit, who go to North Carolina to take on the courage this Friday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, streaming on Paramount+. Plus. And yeah, I don't like to bring this up, but the Spirit and the Courage currently sit 11th and 12th in the table, respectively. You know, no one would have believed that that would be the case, I don't think, before the league 
uh, kicked off your two Challenge Cup finalists, the last two league champions. What do you say to yourself mentally and your teammates going into this matchup? What I was actually saying today with Tori Houston and Aubrey Bledsoe was like, actually, and I was talking to Alana Cook about this when we were on the road. It's like this point last year, the rain were in last um, or second to last or something like that. And for us this point last year, we had just forfeited two games, lost six points. Um, and we're also, you know, I think ninth, eighth, bottom of the table. And so I think what I'm saying to that, to myself and my teammates this point is like anything can happen um but i think that for me the important thing is also to not get too of my head of myself and starting to like calculate points for me i'm just like oh we need a momentum shift like we need a win um so i think everything i'm thinking about is just watching north carolina's previous games and preparing our game plan and to execute that to the best of our ability because that's what's going to get us the result so you like getting your teammates into a huddle being like let's forfeit a couple of games and kickstart this season again let's oh. <laughs> really see what we're made of let's throw some drama in there and then then it's, we'll really know. it's the spirit way and on a brighter <laughs> note of celebration your teammate ashley hatch won the sp last week for the best nwsl player of the year and hatch has been in the league since 2017 she was a golden boot winner last campaign still tends to fly under the radar when the conversation about best forwards in the league is banded around, which I don't understand why she's not in everybody's uh, top list. But can you describe watching her in training week in, week out? What makes her so bloody good? Hatchie is a gem. She is a true professional. And I think her work rate as a nine is amazing. There's not a lot of nines who... Uh, worry about their defensive roles too too much or they worry about them to an extent but Hatchie really owns those and she's just a pest if you ask a lot of center backs in the league who they hate playing against they would say Hatchie so I don't know why either she kind of flies under the radar in terms of you know respect because I think people hate playing her and I think that's a huge compliment for for your center forward well what is it about it that makes you just that player Oh, she's just a pest. And like in the best way, in the you know, the best compliment, she she never gives up on small moments where she could, you know, oh, you know, let this pass and rest and be ready to go for the next one. It's like she's always in it, always paying attention, always looking for an inch, um, looking to get a nick, looking to affect the play, whether that's like a bump or a step or anything. She's just always looking and working. And I think that's why it, i mean it's annoying also on friday 8 p.m eastern on paramount plus euro pool organizer becky sauerbrun's portland thorns go to racing louisville 16 year old olivia moultrie with an absolute worldly last time the thorns took to the field then on saturday we've got a california double header 8 p.m streaming on twitch san diego faces off against the Red Stars. Every team in the league getting a boost from the return of players who've been out with the national team. But you'd have to think, none more so than San Diego, getting Alex Morgan back. She scored 11 out of their 19 goals total this season. Does playing with Alex, training with Alex, does that at least theoretically help you play against them? I think the only way it helps you is just that you grow in respect for her. And so then you have to respect her on the field when you're defending her or uh, I don't really know if you get like insider like oh because she doesn't there's nothing that she doesn't handle well like she can deal with contact she can deal with 1v1s like she can deal with the ball you know crazy balls obviously you saw her first goal in the tournament was like an insane finish with outside of her foot um, so she can handle anything so I think anything that you learn is just to respect her game. And I think for me, what is so brilliant about Alex is the timing of her movement to get in behind. She's always going to pick the most difficult position to work from and time her run just right to really, you know, screw the defenders over. So um, I think just our center backs having to be aware and be sideways on and not let her in behind, which is a tough, a tough task. <laughs> I know it's just tactically, if you hand her a trophy filled with margaritas um, mid in game, <laughs> it can 
It can occasionally, not every time, but sometimes it distracts her. I haven't tried that tactic, (laughs) but maybe uh, we'll see what we can do. I've just given away free tactical advice at 10.30 p.m. Saturday. Oh, well, Rain, go to Angel City. That game streaming on Paramount Plus. And Sunday, we've got Gotham versus Houston Dash, 5 p.m. Eastern Dash coming off a fine win over the Red Stars two weeks ago. That Ebony Salmon hat-trick palooza. Gotham, on the other hand, bouncing off a brutal 5-0 loss to the Thorns. Andy, I know athletes always talk about going to every game with a fresh slate. And granted, in this case, both teams have had that extra week to have the memory of those games evaporate. But in a normal week, how much does a taste of a good win or a bruising loss still reverberate by the time you go into the next game? Mm, I think for me and my teammates, I would say that when you have a tough loss after the off, you're eager to get back and have another game as quickly as possible because you feel this way where you want to right the wrong. Um, Whereas I think if you have a good win, you're like, oh, I can take an extra like active recovery day and like prepare a different way Um, or, you know, hope for an extra day so i think i i could see it working you know for and against both groups uh there's an infinite number of possibilities so i i I think that largely stems from the culture and the messaging um before the send-off of the break and upon your return last but never least kansas city take on orlando pride sunday 7 p.m eastern time on paramount plus try it free on us paramountplus.com slash m-i-b t-w-g that's m-i-b t-w-g and of course you got the euro final that goes down sunday at noon but obvious question for you with england in the final is it coming home andy sullivan i i think it might be honestly i <laughs> i was talking to someone in becky's uh pool and <laughs> they seem to think that it was coming home so apparently apparently it's coming home or it might be coming home you'll have to tune in sunday 12 p.m eastern time on espn to find out if it scientifically will be coming home it's time to close out the week and andy i've got to tell you i love listening to you i really do i take so much away that's nourishing about football and life by listening to you in this time and i'm going to leave the last word to you i cannot speak for the rest of the world but I'd imagine this has been a pretty decent month for you personally. CONCACAF W Championship winners for the ninth time. You'll never sing that. Tell us something that's bringing you joy right now. After the tournament, um, we had a break, like I said, and a lot of people, you know, went on great trips and traveled. I was super anxious to get home to be with Drew and my dog, um, who is not rigging in the back of this podcast and I'm super proud of. Um, <laughs> you're, a bro- you're a broadcasting professional <laughs> the two of you um, but my, my roommate from college came to visit me um, on her way back to New York and I was just really grateful for my friend to take the time and take a detour she was coming back from California and she stopped and came and just hang- hung out with me for a few days and my roommate from college was not a soccer player, which is usually people's first question. So I'm just feeling grateful for um, friends who you might not to get to see all the time, but when you see them, you pick up right where you left off, and that you, when their visits are happening, you don't have to plan too much or do too much. Just really enjoy quality time. So um, that is my my positive vibes for this week. Is some true some true friends. That's incredible. Fred, after spending all of that time in a deep footballing bubble to immerse yourself in friendship out, outside of football, it must have felt like, oh, can you imagine? Just another dimension. <laughs> I, I told a coach, um, a youth coach of mine who was checking in, um, who was a Bayern fan because there was a Bayern game going on in DC. And, um, you know, he's like, are you going to the game? I was like, no, my, I'm picking up my friend. Um, you know, and, you know, she's not a soccer person. He's like, you have non-soccer friends? Like, what? Are you sure? <laughs> yes, one. I'm just kidding, but. Oh, raising a glass to civilians. And that is it for the women's game this week. My joy of the week, as always, is to talk to you, Andy Sullivan. Godspeed. Thank you, Raj. 
I learned that this is my time to talk and I am jumping right in and saying thank you. Okay. Not waiting for us to re-record I'm... that part. Progress. Normally I'm Cooper growing Bob. as a no, podcaster. No, uh, no, normally Cooper Barks right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh we'll be back next Thursday. Godspeed America and courage. Bye.